Hey there, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. It is so nice to see you all. Uh, my name is Jay Gordon. I am a senior program manager with the Azure Cosmos BD DB team. Wow. Getting words out can be difficult. Uh, and uh, welcome to the Azure Cosmos DB global user group. Um, I'm your host. And, you know, we get together at least once a month and we try to bring members of the community here to share what they're up to, what they're building. Uh, today, I have a great guest, Laurie Voss, uh, the VP of Developer Relations at Llama Index. We're going to be talking about some really cool stuff uh, related to uh, retrieval augmented generation. So get ready to learn how to craft, an, uh, a, as we call, a RAG application using Llama Index alongside uh, Azure Cosmos DB. Now, before we do this, it is always important to get out some of our big, big moment, uh, big parts of our housekeeping. And from the Reactor team, I always have a wonderful partner in that uh, is Askia. Hi, Askia. How are you today? Good, Jay. How are you doing? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Uh, so you always have some really important stuff to share with us. Uh, I'd love to hear what we've got going on and uh, what the reactor, some of the things that uh, we need the reactor, uh, I should say, people to know about uh, how to handle themselves here at one of the reactor sessions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, thanks for that. And uh, like Jay said, my name is Eskia. I'm the facilities coordinator here at the Redmond Reactor Space. And we do have a few housekeeping tips just to go over. Um, we uh, seek to uh, provide a respectful environment to all of our presenters and audience members. So we encourage engagement in the chat, but please be respectful, uh, be mindful of your commentary, remain professional, and we ask that you remain on topic. Uh, we will be sharing useful links throughout the chat, so keep an eye open for that. Uh, and for some reason, uh, if you missed part of it or you uh, need to review anything, uh, this session will be available for on-demand viewing on the Microsoft Reactor YouTube channel, and that usually takes about 24 to 48 hours before it is available. Um, that brings us to today's session. It's going to run, run approximately for uh, maybe an hour, and there will be time for questions throughout. So with that said, I will hand it back over to Jay and let you begin. Thanks a lot, Askia. I will see you towards the end of our show. Always appreciate your help. Uh, so today we're going to be talking with a really great guest, uh, Lori Voss. Um, we're going to be learning all about uh, retrieval augmented uh, generation. And uh, I just wanted to set some context for you. So um, I know we you, you probably heard us mention uh, RAG pattern development. Uh, what is uh, retrieval augmented generation? Well. Let, let's talk a little bit about it for a second. Uh, retrieval augmented generation or RAG is like a smart assistant that looks up facts to give you better answers. It digs into big databases to find info, then uses that to respond to your questions more accurately. Uh, a RAG application is a type of software. It smartly pulls information and then helps you answer questions. So we'll learn more about this at, uh, at, at, as the presentation goes on. So the next term that I kind of wanted to talk about is LLM. And uh, please uh, excuse if you hear my dog snorting. He's sleeping behind me. Uh, a large language model or an LLM is a type of AI that understands and generates human-like text by learning from vast amounts of written material. So it's like having a big brain made of words that can chat, answer questions, and even create new content that sounds like it was written by a person. So if you've used ChatGPT or something like that, we all know it can help write big, big ideas based on some keywords and prompts that you give it and kind of helps make life easier for certain people. Yeah. I think that's pretty cool. So a big part of building these type of applications is working with a vector database. And a vector database is a type of database that's really good at handling complex data like images or user preferences, which are stored as vectors or long lists of numbers. Uh, it shines in quickly finding and comparing these vectors to spot similarities, making it perfect for things like recommending a movie or identifying a photo. Essentially, it's a go-to tool for any task where sorting through and making sense of intricate, unstructured data is key. And uh, just to kind of wrap up before I bring in Laurie, um, we're going to talk just a little bit about how uh, Azure Cosmos DB for MongoDB vCore fits in. 
Uh, it supercharges your AI apps by storing and sifting through these uh, pieces of vector data, which is essential for tasks like I had mentioned before, uh, especially like image rock, uh, recommend, excuse me, image recognition or product suggestions. So uh, it lets developers fine tune search accuracy, integrates with tools to streamline data handling and connects with some smart, uh, I should say with open AI for smart language aware applications. Uh, so you can see, you know, great for searching similar content, finding related images, making personalized recommendations, detecting anomalies, answering questions. Uh, so you can get started for free using that service. Um, go to aka.ms slash try Cosmos DB. Cool. So I think I've set some context. And now to actually help bring in some more information about how you can start working with this with Llama Index is uh, Lori. Hi, Lori. How are you today? Hi, Jay. I'm great. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I, you know, before we started uh, this and we were talking, I, I was just saying about how you and I have probably been talking on the internet for years on Twitter, going back and forth on whether it's technology, life, silly things, doesn't matter. Uh, we, we've talked about a lot of cool stuff in the past. And, you know, I had this idea that it would be really wonderful to get you part of this show to be able to kind of learn a little bit more about the product you're working on, which is is very, very much um, important to people like uh, our audience who wants to build these uh, RAG uh, forward applications. But before I want you to start presenting, I want to just ask a little bit about you. Um, so you're the Developer Re Relations VP at Llama Index. Mind telling me a little bit about how you got into a position like that? Uh, sure. Um... It's been uh, a long and twisty journey, really. Um, I started out 27 years ago uh, as a web developer. Um, I was a front-end developer and then a back-end developer. I became a DBA for a while. I was an ops guy for a while. Um, in 2013, um, I did a uh, developer-focused startup. Um, we did analytics for social media. Um, and, uh, then in 2014, uh, I co-founded NPM, um, where we were deeply immersed in the world of JavaScript, uh, for, uh, you know, four or five years there before Microsoft, uh, <laughs> took it off our hands. Um, the, the thing that I did at, at NPM. Um, well, I was co-founder, so initially I did everything, but as we got bigger, what I ended up specializing into uh, was digging into the data of um, all of the users of NPM and what they were doing and what the world of JavaScript was up to uh, and relaying that information back out to the developer community. Um, mm -hmm. And that is really what got me into the sort of headspace of developer relations. I've always had uh, you know, a soft spot for uh, the working developer, uh, and having all of this information that was super helpful to them, um, was a really great position in which to be. Um, so, uh, I took another little sidetrack, uh, to work at Netlify after NPM. I did uh, data science there, got even more into data, um, and got into AI and LLMs as part of my data science work. Uh, so then I decided to, you know, recombine those two tracks of my life. Uh, and take the developer relations side and the AI side. Uh, and that is how I got to Lama Index. Cool. You know, DevRel is such an important part of, you know, I always say um, it, it's one thing to write some code and to put it in a repo. It's a whole other thing to tell the world about it and make sure people are getting some use out of it and being able to build things and contribute. So I think that's, that's really important. Um, so Today, you've got some things to show us about Llama Index, and I'd love to give you some space to go ahead and start doing a presentation. Uh, so while we're doing this, if you have questions, we would love you to share them with us. So just put them in the chat. We'll address them as soon as possible. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to, like I said, give you some room to start your presentation. Um, if we have anything, I will pop in. So please. All right. Thanks, Jay. Uh, and hi, everybody. Um, like Jay said, I am uh, VP of Developer Relations at Llama Index. Uh, 
But uh, if you know me, you'd probably know me from the time that I was at, Dow at NPM. Uh, we did a lot of JavaScript in that time. Um, what I'm talking about today is AI. Uh, and I'm talking to a database user group. So I'm not going to assume that you know or even care about AI. So uh, let's start with some basics. Um, what is AI? What is Llama Index? And then we're going to work our way up uh, to our main topic today, which is uh, retrieval augmented generation, which is a very important technique in modern AI applications. And we'll discuss how to implement it using Azure Cosmos DB and Llama Index specifically. Uh, and then uh, having covered the basics, we will go into uh, more advanced techniques uh, that we can implement at scale. Uh, so let's dive right in. Um, Jay briefly covered what is AI. It is the field of making computers do things that seem like they should require human intelligence to do. I say seems like uh, because we keep discovering that things that humans can do are far less complicated than we imagined that they would be. Uh, for instance, uh, AI includes computer vision. When I was at college, computer vision was considered to be uh, this impossible dream that it would require a whole uh, human brain and a lifetime's worth of experience to be able to look at something and interpret what it is. Uh, but things like OpenAI are multimodal now. They can just look at a picture and tell us what it is. Um, and we have really great OCR that can you know, read letters and tell us what those words are. Um, and that's using a much simpler technique uh, called machine learning. Um, machine learning is a process of giving computers basically a huge number of labeled examples of how to do something. So you give them like a picture of text and then you give them the actual text that that means and you do that a billion times in a row uh, and it's possible for the computer to learn these letters equal this text. Uh, and so nearly everything that you hear about referred to as AI recently um, is actually machine learning. It's a specific part of the AI field, um, but it is uh, now it is by far the largest part. Uh, plus there's a lot of clever marketing because AI sounds cooler than ML. Um, which brings us to the current boom in AI, uh, which is large language models or LLMs, which Jay also mentioned. Um, you've also almost certainly heard of ChatGPT. ChatGPT is an LLM. Um, the way I think of an LLM is LLMs are basically fancy autocomplete. If you give it the cat sat on the, it will know that the next word is the mat. Uh, and the reason it knows that is because it's seen billions and billions of examples of English text. And it knows that that's the word that usually comes after uh, the cat sat on the. Um, because like I said, most ML is just learning by example. Um, with LLMs, the examples, the, with you know, large language models, the examples that we've given it are substantially every single thing that humanity has ever taken the time to write down. Uh, so the surprising result is that LLMs can, you know, they can autocomplete more than just a simple sentence. Um, they can complete, you know, whole paragraphs. They can do what looks like uh, creative and analytical thinking. Um, which raises a fun philosophical question, right? Like if we thought that computer vision was complicated and it turned out to be uh, relatively simple to simulate using ML, what if thinking isn't actually that complicated? What if we've already created machines that are as conscious as we are and we just don't recognize that that's what's happened? Uh, if you wanna put it another way, what if the stuff that we do is really not that much more complicated than what the LLM is doing? What if, uh, you know, what if we are just fancy autocomplete? What if we are the sum of our experiences and we're just like filling in the next word frantically all the time? Uh, it's kind of terrifying to think about, honestly. Uh, and it is not what we're going to be focused on today. Uh, we have created machines that seem like they think. And today we're going to be using them to do useful tasks. So that brings us to retrieval augmented generation. Um, I said that we trained these LLMs with nearly everything that we've ever written down, but nearly is the important word there. What about the documents that you have at your company? Uh, the LLMs weren't trained on them. It would be worrying if they were, how would they get those documents? So they can't answer questions about the documents that live inside your company. Uh, and that is a problem because that's what nearly everybody wants answers about. They want answers about their data. They don't usually want general purpose answers about information out in the world. Um, and so the solution is to give the machines context. Uh, 
you give them the information that you're talking about and you get them to answer questions about it very quickly. Um, they can absorb an enormous amount of information at once. Um, so you can give them a whole document and say, summarize this and they'll do it in a second. Modern LLMs can absorb uh, something like a whole book's worth of context all in one go. Uh, but even that is not good enough because your company doesn't have just one book's worth of data. It probably has multiple or even hundreds of books worth of data. So for giving context to work, you have to be selective. You have to say, I'm going to give you the relevant context, the context that is relevant to the question that I am asking so that you can answer that question. Um, as it happens, uh, giving LLMs specific context solves two other problems that LLMs have. The first is uh, what are called hallucinations. Uh, that's where the fancy autocomplete, autocomplete something that sounds plausible, uh, but isn't actually true. Um, with retrieval augmented generation, you're able to instruct the LLM to only work with the information that you have just given it. Don't hallucinate, don't make up something plausible, use only the information that I've just given you. Uh, and that solves a second problem, which is provenance. When you get the answer, uh, you want to know how it knows that answer. You want to know which document that answer came from. Um, when the answer comes from the LLM's giant pile of training data, there's really no way for it to tell you where it learned some specific fact or whether it was making it up. Uh, but with retrieval augmented generation, you've just given it the context. So it can point at the specific document that it was just looking at and say, this is what is true and this is why where i got that information that is a very useful thing for a machine to be able to do so that is retrieval augmented generation you retrieve specific relevant context you augment your question with that data and then the element llm generates a response uh, but that leaves open a very big question which is how do you retrieve relevant context uh, the relevance is the important part there it turns out there's a really nifty mechanism that makes this work really well that also comes from the world of machine learning. When LLMs learn information, what they're really doing is converting it into numbers, specifically the types of numbers called vectors. We call the total set of available vectors the vector space. So when you convert your data into vectors, uh, we say that you are embedding it into vector space. We call these numbers uh, embeddings for short. So in this example, you can see the cat sat on the mat, the dog sat on the frog. These turn out to be points in vector space. An amazing property of vector embeddings is that if you take a question and you convert that into a vector as well, uh, then it will end up nearby in vector space to the data that contains the answer. So you can see the cat sat on the mat turns into the red dot. The question, where did the cat sit, turns into an orange dot. And in vector space, these are nearby to each other. Uh, this isn't keyword matching, it is encoding the meaning of the question. Uh, and once you've got all of your meanings embedded in vector space, you can use relatively simple mathematical operations to find things that are nearby to your question and therefore are probably relevant to your answer, which is a really magical property of this whole thing. And it's what makes uh, retrieval augmented generation work. So that's how it works. First, you embed all of your data into vector space. Then you embed your query using the same model. And you perform this relatively simple math, which tells you which chunks are closest in meaning to your question. Those are the most significant pieces of context. So you send those plus your question to an LLM. And most of the time, that's enough to get a right answer. One of the things that's interesting about LLMs is that they are autocomplete. So the reason they give you an answer is because you gave them a question. They don't have to answer questions. That's not necessarily what they do. If I gave it the cat sat on the, it would just it would just autocomplete the mat. Uh, but because I give it a question, the thing that usually follows a question is an answer, and so it gives answers. So all of this so far has been the basic theory. This is how does but how does all of this stuff work in a real application? Let's think about the architecture of a real retrieval augmented generation application uh, and step through the stages of that. So first, you get your data wherever it is. Your data can be in lots of places. It could be a pile of text. It could be PDF files. It could be Word documents. It could be sitting in Slack or, Google, or uh, Microsoft Teams or Google Drive. It could be sitting in a SQL database or behind an API. So this process of loading your data into your application can be quite complicated. 
Once you've got all of your data, you have to embed your data into vector space so that you can find the most relevant data later. That is the indexing phase. Uh, you give your data to an embedding model and you split it up into lots and lots and lots of tiny chunks. And then you give, you give those chunks to the embedding model, it turns them into vectors uh, and you go to the next stage, which is that you need to store all of those vectors somewhere. This is usually done using a specialized database called a vector store, which is optimized to be able to search through vectors uh, and do that simple math that I was talking about to be able to find stuff nearby in vector space. This is obviously where uh, Azure Cosmos DB is going to come in. This is the storage phase. Then there's the phase we call querying, which is really a combination of three different things. First, you have to retrieve your context, like I said, based on what your query is. And then there's a variety of strategy, and there's a variety of strategies to do that. Um, but then you combine your context and your query with a finely tuned prompt, uh, which is just a set of instructions to the LLM about how to answer the question. Uh, and you combine your context and your query and your prompt, and you send that to the LLM. You call that stage synthesis, and the LLM then returns results, which you can then further post-process. For instance, one of the things you can do uh, is in your prompt is you can say return JSON instead of plain text. Uh, and then you, your post-processing stage can make sure that, it, that what has been returned is valid JSON. All of which now brings us neatly to Llama index. Uh, all of those stages of an application, getting those right uh, is a lot of work. Uh, Llama index is a framework for doing all of that work for you. It is a framework for building RAG applications. It is open source and it's free and it's available at llamaindex.ai. Um, we have versions available in both Python and TypeScript. Um, today, I'm going to be using the Python version since it has better support for Azure Cosmos DB. Uh, Llama Index also provides a registry called Llama Hub, uh, which is at llamahub.ai. Um, the hub provides a huge library of software to help making make building RAG applications easier. Uh, I mentioned that the loading phase can be tricky because there's so many places that your data can be. Llama Hub provides hundreds of connectors that connect to your favorite data source and make it a lot easier. Um, Llama Hub also includes tools for agents, which we're going to be discussing later. Later, uh, it includes data sets for testing, uh, and it includes pre-written code snippets, which we call Llama Packs, which again help you get going faster with various techniques. Thirdly, and most importantly, Llama Hub is a way to get your AI creations into production. Uh, there's a lot of ways that we facilitate that, but one that's got a lot of traction recently uh, is a command line tool called Create Llama, uh, which you can run by just running npx create llama if you've got Node.js installed. Um, it is loosely based on how cr the Create React app used to work. It's an application generator, uh, and it what it produces is a ready to ship RAG application with a working front end and a back end in your choice of serverless TypeScript or Node.js or Python. Um, but today I'm going to be doing one better than that. I'm going to be providing you with an open source repo for an AI application that works with Azure Cosmos DB specifically. Uh, by default, Llama Index uses OpenAI as the LLM uh, because it's easy and everyone knows it. Um, but we support more than 25 different models and APIs, including local embedding models and LLMs. So uh, we're going to be using OpenAI today, uh, but we don't have to. There are lots and lots of other ways to get your uh, to get your LLMs working, including running on your local machine. Uh, we also support over 30 da vector databases, such as Azure Cosmos DB and dozens more. It's a very crowded category. We are an extremely batteries included framework. Um, in addition to all those LLMs and vector stores and all the connection libraries on, on Llama Hub, uh, we provide advanced retrieval strategies right out of the box, as I'm going to show you today, uh, including agents, that is semi-autonomous uh, pieces of software. Uh, and we also handle multimodality, so that is images and audio in addition to text. Um, we also have integrations to support observability uh, and an array of tools to allow you to run evaluations. I couldn't possibly cover all of the stuff uh, that we do in the time that we have today. So uh, today I'm going to focus on getting up and running using Llama and Index uh, and Azure Cosmos DB. Um, and we'll talk about some advanced querying strategies that can take the work that I'm going to show you uh, today further than where we're going to take it today. So let's dive into some actual code. 
Here is the very simplest way to use Llama index. I'm gonna step through it line by line because um, we're very proud of our six line starter. Uh, this first line, we just bring in our dependencies. In the second line, we use a data loader. Like I said, you can get these uh, from Llama Hub called Simple Directory Reader. It takes any documents that it finds uh, in a folder called data uh, and it loads them into memory for us to play with. In the third line, we create a vector store index. This is a vector store, but it's one that lives entirely in memory. It takes the documents that we loaded and it embeds them and then stores the embeddings in memory. So this is both the indexing and storing phases that I talked about. Next, we create a query engine from the index. This covers the retrieval, the synthesis, and the processing that I talked about in that architecture diagram of a RAG application. And finally, we give it a query. It retrieves the relevant context from the vector store. It throws the context and the query plus a prompt to OpenAI. Um, because OpenAI is the default, we didn't need to specify it. Uh, and it returns the response uh, for us to print out. Uh, and then you're done. That is all of the stages of RAG, RAG application uh, in just six lines of code. Like I said, we try to make this really simple. Uh, but obviously, making it that simple uh, is a toy example. So let's look at something more realistic. Uh, for your convenience, I have pre-baked an application for you. Uh, it consists of a backend in Python and a front end in the Next.js JavaScript framework. Um, plus some utility scripts to get it up and running. Uh, it has an extensive readme attached and that walks you through everything that I'm going to show you today step by step. Um, so I don't need to bore you with every detail of every line of code uh, for this entire application. You can get this repo and clone it and get it up and running yourself. Um, we're just going to be focusing on some of the key points of this application and how it works. Uh, I really like that everybody uh, is throwing links into the chat. So if somebody could throw a link to the repo into the chat, that would be great. Um, the architecture of this application is really quite simple. Um, we start with a pile of raw JSON. Uh, in this case, it's some tweets that I made in 2019, uh, about a thousand of them. I tweeted a lot more times than a thousand times in 2019. This is just a subset, unfortunately. Uh, and we're going to load those tweets into Azure Cosmos DB. Uh, then we're going to index them, i.e. we're going to turn them all into piles of numbers and store them in a vector database. In this case, the vector database is going to be Azure Cosmos DB again, um, but this time with a specialized index attached that quickly does those mathematical operations that I was talking about uh, to locate things that are nearby in vector space. <coughs> Excuse me. And once we've got that pre-index vector database, that's what we're going to give to our Python backend. The backend will accept queries uh, from our front end, do the retrieval augmented generation, and return responses. So let's get into that. The first thing we need to do is step through the steps of uh, getting our database up and running. We need to get ourselves an Azure Cosmos DB cluster to do all of this stuff with. I'm going to step through these really quickly because this is your database. So I'm going to assume you're very familiar with how you get it up and running. So in the console, we select create. Uh, we need it to be a MongoDB API. Specifically, we need it to be a vCore cluster. Uh, we're going to configure the cluster. I chose the free tier. Uh, the important thing here is that you're going to need to pick a username and password because you're going to need to use them in with our connection string later. Um, and for networking, we're gonna be wild and crazy um, and leave it open to the entire internet, which isn't a good idea. Uh, but it's fine for a demo. Uh, and finally, we go to our connection strings and grab our connection string, which is what we need for the next step. So this is the first script in our repo. It is called uh, import. Um, and this is basically the whole script. There's nothing Llama index specifically here. All I'm, all I'm doing is uh, setting up a MongoDB client, connecting to our database uh, and loading in the tweets. Um, if you have some data that you want to use yourself that's already in a Mongo collection in Azure Cosmos DB, then you can skip this step entirely. You can read, uh, you can use your JSON instead of my JSON. Um, for this thing, it need, for this thing to work, it needs the connection string. You can see it passing the MongoDB URI uh, that we just got from our cluster. And we need to give it a, a database name and a collection name. 
Uh, next, we need to load the generic data that we put into a generic Mongo collection uh, into the specific document objects that Llama Index needs to work. Uh, to do this, we use a loader from Llama Hub. Um, and this happens in a file called uh, load and index. Uh, you see me passing an empty query dictionary at the end there. That is, that is one way that we could uh, filter our text uh, or our uh, tweets down or our data down to a specific subset of data to load. Uh, but in this case, I want all of them. So I've just left it empty. Um, oh, and the other thing that I should mention here is the field name full text. So in our tweet objects, the text of the actual tweet is in a field called full text. If you were using your own data source rather than mine, uh, you would have to specify what field the text was in, uh, in that thing. You could specify more than one if you wanted. So uh, given the name of that script, which is load and index, you can imagine what it does next, uh, which is that it indexes things. Um, you can see how easy we've made this. There is a specific Azure Cosmos DB MongoDB vector search, very catchily named class. Um, it takes a Mongo client. It takes the same database name that we gave it before, and it takes two new names. Uh, it, it needs a collection name that we're going to uh, store our vectors in, and it needs an index name that we're going to use for the uh, vector index. But as you can see, it's five lines long. It's very neat and convenient. And the last thing the load and index script does uh, is actually calculate all of those embeddings. Um, so it creates a storage context, including the vector store that we just created. And then it creates an index from those documents and that storage context. Uh, to do this, it's making API calls to what is called an embedding model. Uh, you can have a local embedding model if you want to. It's just you know converting text into vectors. Um, but in this case, we are by default going to be using OpenAI's embedding model. So we're not using the OpenAI LLM here. We are using a different API from OpenAI uh, for calculate for converting text into vectors. Um, because we have to make, like I said, we split our text into lots and lots of little chunks um, before we embed it. This means that you have to make a whole lot of API calls to get this done. So this stage can take a while. Um, but luckily you only need to do it once. And then once everything is embedded, it's very fast to work with. Uh, the show progress equals true there uh, means that when you're running this on the command line, it shows a nice little progress bar. So you don't have to uh, just be blindly waiting several minutes while it does the calculations. And fine, so that means we're ready to query our data. Our database is already prepped. Querying is just two lines. You create a query engine um, and then you run your query and you get a response. Uh, there's an extra parameter here, which I should explain, which is similarity top K. Um, by default, uh, the number of pieces of context that our retriever will retrieve is two. Uh, that is because it is expecting to have split up like a large text document into paragraphs worth of text. Uh, but tweets are small. so. Uh, I wanted to have more than two tweets uh, to be able to answer a question. So I've set my similarity top K here to 20. So it's going to retrieve 20 tweets, basically. Uh, the remainder of the repo, if you're following along on GitHub, um, is the process of setting up a back end and a front end uh, to do this querying in a web app. Uh, if you are interested in that part, I recommend following along in the repo. My example deploys to render, uh, which I realize is not a very Azure thing way of doing things. Uh, so uh, it was my conclusion that you might prefer to do it some other way, some more Azure way. So I'm not going to walk you step by step through how to deploy things to render. Uh, instead, let's skip straight to a very, very quick demo. So you should now be able to see my demo application, uh, it's a very simple React front end that sends basically one piece of text to a single API endpoint on the back end. Uh, let's ask it questions about me. What, how does the author feel about Star Trek? So 
this application knows quite a lot about my opinions about things because uh, for the purposes of this demo, I secretly loaded more than 1,000 tweets. I loaded uh, 60,000 tweets. So it knows about a whole bunch of things that I've said over the years. And it has a pretty good idea about how I feel about things. Uh, how does the author feel about web frameworks? I have all sorts of feelings about web frameworks, it turns out. Um, think about what it's doing here. It's not finding a piece of information where I said, here are my feelings about web frameworks. What it's doing is doing a retrieval in vector space of everything where I appeared to be talking about web frameworks. It's looking at all of those pieces of text and then it's summarizing them down uh, to this con condensed version of how I feel about uh, web frameworks. This is a very complicated piece of information about which it really understands. This is a truly magical feature of how uh, LLMs work in general and how RAG applications can work. So that is the demo. That is the basic application. Um, but uh, that is the most basic way uh, that you can put together a RAG application. All it's doing is just looking at all of the tweets that exist uh, and trying to find the 20 most relevant ones. Um, there is a lot more that you can do. There's a lot more to go beyond this. Um, it works pretty amazingly well, uh, given that this is the most basic implementation of RAG that you could possibly imagine. Um, but real world applications have more demands. Uh, sometimes it's scale. Um, sometimes you just have more documents. Sometimes they require more precision. Uh, or provenance, especially have really big chunks. Uh, and sometimes things are just more complicated. Tweets are very simple. They're just little strings of text, but documents uh, can be really complicated as we're going to see. And we actually have a question about documents, uh, if you don't mind, just to take a quick interlude. Uh, Absolutely. Pamela, Pamela wants to know if uh, Llama Index can ingest PDFs, HTML, and CSV, DOCX, PPTX. So like pretty standard file extensions that uh, people use for sharing information. Yep, it can do uh, the, in fact, the simple directory reader that I showed you uh, can read almost all of those by itself. Uh, it is an extremely capable reader. And we have one more question from Pamela and then I'll let you continue. Um, has Llama indexed on tests on non-English content like CJK languages? We've gotten some issues reporting regarding ingestion, like punctuation for those. Uh, that is an excellent question. Um, Llama Index works fine with those things. Uh, what doesn't necessarily work fine with those things is OpenAI. Um, the LLMs are trained on what they're trained on. So if your LLM has been trained primarily on English language, um, then it's going to not do as well with other languages. Uh, and in particular, your embedding model is very important. If your embedding model only works for English languages, um, then it's going to get um, the kinds of problems that you just mentioned. It's going to uh, not recognize what punctuation looks like. Um, it's not going. It's going to. Uh, we've seen um, when languages have multi-byte representations of particular words. We've seen the chunking split things up uh, in the middle of a word or in the middle of a letter. Uh, in some cases, uh, producing nonsense. Um, luckily, there are embedding models that are designed for every language, uh, basically, all of the major languages anyway. Uh, and there are LLMs that are trained on those languages. Um, I don't have them immediately to hand, uh, but I know that there are LLMs that are specifically being trained on French, on German, uh, on various forms of Chinese, on Japanese. Uh, there was uh, a really interesting one released recently uh, that was trained on uh, various forms of Arabic. Uh, so if you pick the right LLM and the right embedding model, uh, you can get around those sorts of problems and Llama Index will work with them just fine. But great, that's a really great, great question. Uh, we got, thank you very much, Pamela. Those were great questions. Uh, we have one more. Um, if you'd like to continue in the presentation, feel free. If not, uh, I can go ahead and ask it now. Uh, sure, let's do one more. Great. Uh, Prasad asked, if text is stored in Cosmos DB and videos and images on blob storage, can Llama Index connect two sources 
at the same time and retrieve results for RAG applications. Absolutely. And in fact, uh, some of the examples that I'm about to be going into uh, are a great example of how that would work. Wow. Thank you, Prasad, for the uh, right on topic uh, question. Cool. So let me let you get to that. Um, we've got about around 20 minutes of time left. So take as much as you need. Cool. cool. Um, I'm certainly not going to need 20 minutes. So this is going to be a bit of a fly through tour of the ways that you can do this stuff. Um, So the first strategy that we're going to be looking into is uh, the sub question query engine, uh, which like all of these examples is a class built into Llama index. So you don't have to implement this strategy yourself. You can just call it directly. Um, in this case, instead of having a single query engine, uh, you can set up as many as you like. Uh, and you give each one a description of what has been indexed. So uh, to Prasad's question that you could, one of the things that you could do is you could say, uh, you know, this index, is an index of all of the text that I've written. This index is an index of a whole bunch of images. And this index is a bunch of, of video. And you can give all of those to the sub-question query engine. Um, then when you get a query, what the sub-question query engine does is it talks to the LLM. It gives the question to the LLM. And it says, take this question and split it up, given that these are the tools that I've got. Tell me what the simpler questions that I could ask each of these indexes is and ask them and tell me which index I should ask the question to. Uh, then takes it, it then runs all of those queries and takes all of those answers and summarizes them into a single response. So that response can be uh, a single answer or it can be a multimodal response, including text and images. Uh, the second strategy that I want to talk about is small to big retrieval. Uh, this can help when you need precision, but you don't want to lose context. So uh, like I said, you split your source data up into lots and lots of tiny chunks. Uh, and then your retrieval step can retrieve one extremely precisely targeted chunk. Uh, but that chunk by itself not, might not be enough to answer the question. Imagine you were looking for, uh, you know, your data was about um, real estate and you were looking for a specific house. Uh, but the in, and you found the address of the house using retrieval, but you need to know the information around the house that surrounds it. So you can use uh, small to big retrieval to fetch the chunks before and after uh, as many of them as you think you need uh, and give those to the LLM so that it has full context before it answers the question. A third tactic is metadata filtering. Uh, this is a tactic that's great when you have lots and lots and lots of documents and you want to scale up. Um, what it's doing uh, is it's making use of the fact that you already know quite a lot about your data already. You could just give uh, your vector database all of your documents uh, just blindly, um, but you probably have some metadata about those documents already. For instance, you probably know when those documents were created. Um, so. You can tag your data with any metadata you've got. For instance, you could tag it with the year that it was created. Uh, then when the LLM gets, the, gets a query, it can look at the types of metadata available to it, uh, and it can automatically run a filter. Like it can literally call the database filter. It says, filter these documents down to documents from 2001 before you give me the uh, queries. Uh, sorry, before you give me the, the uh, context. And then it takes within that smaller set, it does the uh, vector search that we talk about. Um, the uh, closely related to that is hybrid search. Um, we've been talking so far about vector search. Vector search is amazing. It is searching by meaning. That is groundbreaking stuff. Uh, but we've also spent 30 years getting really good at keyword searching. Uh, stuff like Google. Um, and there's no way, no reason to throw all of that work away. Uh, using hybrid search, you can have both a vector index and a traditional search index, give them both the same set of data, and you can blend your results. So if the keyword search thinks that it's found a really great result, and the vector search thinks it's found a pretty bad result, or it's not very confident, uh, your blended results will give you the keyword matches instead of the vector results. Um, this is a really great tactic, and you can, you know, you can slide, you can basically adjust a slider uh, 
of how much weight you want to give vector search versus how much weight you want to give keyword search. And it's a great way of uh, improving your accuracy. But what if your problem isn't scale across lots of documents, but complexity within a document? Uh, one of the things that LLMs are notoriously bad at uh, is reading tables. Um, but ordinary machines, uh, ordinary computers find tables pretty easy to parse. Tabular data is what you know computers are good at. Um, so what you can do is instead of getting the LLM to try to read a table, uh, you can give get the LLM to read a tool. Um, so for this strategy, instead of just splitting your data in blindly into text chunks, you can detect when you're looking at something like a table or something like a chart, uh, and you can assign specific tools to read them. For instance, in Python, there's a great library called Pandas, which is really great at uh, um, interpreting and manipulating uh, tabular data. So you take the text data and you, you take the table and you split it up and put it into Pandas. Um, the LLM is capable of writing accurate code to utilize pandas to query the contents of the table. For instance, it could sum up the values in that table. Uh, it can do that and then combine it with the ordinary text nodes to give uh, an accurate uh, answer to a complicated question that involves reading a table. Similar to uh, that technique, which is called recursive retrieval, um, is text to SQL. Um, much like an LLM can write pandas commands, if you give uh, your LLM the schema of a database um, and access to that database via a tool, uh, more advanced LLMs are capable of writing valid SQL to be able to query that database. Uh, if your table is, if your data is already in giant SQL tables, this can make a lot more sense uh, than turning it all into vector into text and then embedding that text into vector space. If you have very specific, if you have already have very highly structured data, uh, then there's no reason to unstructure it and then <laughs> attempt to query it. You can get the LLM to run structured queries, uh, which of course it can then combine with other contexts to answer a more complicated question. And our final stop on this whirlwind tour of strategies is multi-document agents. Uh, I mentioned very early on that Llama Hub has tools uh, that you can use uh, to build agents. Um, like I said, with the you know the pandas tool and the text to SQL tool, you can find those on Llama Hub. Um, but what a multi-document agent does is essentially it allows you to combine all of these strategies into one, somewhat like uh, the sub-question query engine does. Uh, you can define as many tools as you want. So one could use metadata filtering, another one could do hybrid search, a third could be doing text to SQL, and each of them could be pointed at different data sources like Prasad's question earlier. Um, the agent then receives a question and it decides which tool or tools are the best to answer it, and it can run queries against those. One of the neat things about agents is that they are autonomous. So if an agent runs a query against a tool and it gets a nonsensical answer or it doesn't find the answer to the question, it can interpret that and say, okay, I didn't get the answer. Let me try a different tool. Let me try again with a different question. Um, and it is smart enough to keep trying those other tools uh, until it eventually has enough context that it can properly answer the question. Uh, the ability to compose strategies this way, uh, by which I mean combine you know, all of these different techniques that I've talked about into a single very powerful tool, uh, is a really great way to scale up uh, to a real world application. And uh, the great part is that you don't have to put together all of this stuff from scratch, because like I said, Llama Hub has pre-built tools that you can download. Speaking of pre-built things, uh, if you want to see a more complicated example than the ones that I've been showing you so far, uh, we have an open source website called secinsights.ai. Um, it is a website that you can try out and also an open source repo that you can look at. Uh, what it does is it parses and compares financial filings um, from a variety of companies across a number of years. Uh, and it's a great way to see these strategies that I've been, talk that I've been talking about uh, and dig into the code and see how they are done. So to recap all the stuff that we've covered today, we discussed at a high level what AI is, we delved into what RAG is more specifically, 
including how vector search works. We then covered Llama Index, what it is and why to use it, including associated tools like Llama Hub and Create Llama. Uh, and next, we looked at a real working open source application using Azure Cosmos DB uh, for MongoDB specifically. Uh, and then we wrapped up with a quick tour of what your next steps might be in terms of customizing an application for greater complexity or scale or performance. Um, I hope this has been a useful introduction to the power of retrieval augmented generation and AI in general. Uh, this field is very, very new and everyone is learning at once. So uh, there's never been a better time to dive in and give it a try. Uh, and thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. That was fantastic. I, I learned a ton in this. And, um, you know, one of the questions that I had, and then we're going to, I think we got another great question from our audience. Uh, Prasad has another wonderful question. Um, you know, deployment methodologies uh, for when you're going to take this into production. Um, are there any like preferred architectures, uh, say using microservices or something like that, that people have built uh, utilizing Llama Index? Um, yeah, I mean, intrinsically, uh, intrinsically, what you get when you produce a Llama Index service is usually a Python application, uh, and it is the world. The world of web development doesn't really use Python, uh, mm -hmm. so it's a really great um, it's a really great application of microservices because you can encapsulate all of your Python into your backend API, uh, and like in this demo example. Uh, create a completely separate front end in TypeScript uh, that allows you to uh, split that up and, and handle that separately. Fantastic. Um, we're going to uh, say, you know, uh, Romy uh, loves this, says it's great, really happy that there is a GitHub repo so you can start building stuff right away. Um, Employ California loves that we're all learning together. Hope you all find a job in California. Um, we've got some other questions. Uh, one of them is, uh, how does one assess the query retrieval accuracy of hybrid search for providing weightage for vector search and keyword search? Is it by trial and error based on results provided and adjust the weightage? It's a little bit out of my, uh, skill set. So maybe you've got something that you can share on that. Um, Prasad, that's an excellent question. Um, I mentioned right at the beginning that one of the topics that I wouldn't be covering is evaluations. Um, one of the uh, key parts of building uh, any AI application is evaluations because they are so flexible and their answers are not, you know, black and white, you know, yes or no. Uh, you need to know that a change that you've made has made things better or worse. Uh, so. Llama Index has a whole suite of tools for doing evaluations, which basically you take an existing set of data where you know what the answers are supposed to be, uh, and you give that as your test uh, to the application that you've put together. So you say, you know, here is the SATs and all of my answers to the SATs, or uh, here is a document uh, where I know all of the answers in the document, and here is a bunch of questions about that document and the answers, and you can score your application basically on how well it's doing relative to how a human would answer it. Um, and you can do that over and over very quickly. Uh, so every time you make a change to your application, you can rerun your evaluation and figure out uh, whether or not you've improved matters. That is, that's the core of how you iterate on an AI application. But an excellent, excellent question. I agree. Well, I think we've just hit the end of our question and uh, answer session, and we want to start wrapping up. Uh, so before I bring uh, Askia back, I uh, wanted to ask you, uh, Lori, what is the best way people can reach you if they'd love to talk more about this, learn more about Llama Index, uh, and even just best way to get started using Llama Index? Uh, so llamaindex.ai is our homepage. We have um, our documentation is extremely extensive. Um, we also have a very big Discord that you can join from that page. Um, we have a mailing list where we send you tips and tricks every single week. Uh, and if you want to talk to me specifically, uh, probably the best way is to find me on Twitter. I am Seldo on Twitter. Yep, you can see right down there, if I can point to you. There we go, I'm pointing down in that direction. <laughs> you can see uh, at Seldo. Uh, great, so let's bring in my uh, 
regular partner here at uh, the reactor, uh, Askia. How are you? Did you learn something? Do you feel good about it? Yeah, that was excellent, Lori. Thank you so much for uh, that. And I want to thank the audience for some excellent questions as well. Um, you know, I am not a tech person, so uh, a lot of times stuff goes right over my head, but um, I definitely learned a lot. This was, uh, it was great. So I thank you so much and thank everybody for attending. Um, we would love to hear what you have to say. So Jay has uh, so kindly put up our survey link. So if you could take some time to just give us a feedback on the session, we will use that uh, to improve and tailor uh, our future uh, future events. So once again, thanks everybody. Yes, absolutely sp uh, fantastic to always partner with the reactor. Uh, we really uh, always appreciate uh, your support in all these sessions that we do. Uh, we do have another great session next month. Um, You'll be able to check out uh, Accelerated Data Movement to uh, Cosmos with Fivetran. We got a great person from Fivetran, one of our partners. Um, but we're done here today. We did all this today. We uh, learned a lot more about uh, rag pattern, how to utilize it in building applications. We learned a ton today. And so that being said, here comes the goodbye music. There we are. Hey. Lori, thank you so much for being part of this today. I had a great Thanks for time. inviting me, Jay. Absolutely. And we'd love to have you back in the future. If you got something new and great to show us, we'd love to have you a part. Cool. Great. Uh, Astia, I will see you again next month. Thank you always. And and to our, yeah, our audience, I want to say, you know, uh, we really had one of our best sessions this week. Uh, I am so thankful to all of you. We can't do these without you participating. And so uh, I want you to take a moment and realize that you can participate more than just being the audience member. If you want to present at a future meetup, fill out this intake form, go ahead, be part. We'd love to hear what you're up to because our community is so important to us. Uh, so that being said, it is time to say goodbye. Uh, let's give everybody the big wave goodbye. Thank you so much, everyone. We loved having this time with you, and we will be seeing you again next month. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Askia. See you all next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.